Good morning, God's beloved, and welcome to online worship at Lee Summit Christian Church. We are grateful for your presence with us in worship on this seventh Sunday of Easter. We invite you, if you're comfortable doing so, to let us know you're here with us by using the comment section, or you can share this video with your friends and family members. You might also find it helpful to find a candle to light in your home. This light reminds us of Christ's presence as we worship. You can also find some common elements in your home, such as something small to eat and drink, as we will share in communion together later in worship. No matter how you found your way to us on this day, know that at least Summit Christian Church, you are welcome. Let, Let us, us worship, worship together. together. the fourth Sunday of the month, which means it's Sanctuary Kids. Today would be our last Sanctuary Kids for the school year. I thought it would be nice to listen to our children pray today. Dear God, please listen to our children pray. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the birds and the animals. Thank you for the flowers and trees. Thank you for the lakes and the streams and the sun that rises and sets over them each day. Thank you for creating everything we see. Thank you for the life we live. Thank you for making each and every one of us different. Let us say together the prayer your son taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be my name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power and the glory forever. Psalm 145, the greatness and the goodness of God. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. 
One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Would you pray with me? Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be found acceptable in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On a late autumn afternoon five centuries ago, Brother James was happy with anticipation. The painting on the test pieces of glass was completed and he inspected his work in the warm afternoon sun coming through the open door of his workshop and carefully shifted the glass into the kiln. He was confident that the new mixture of metals with which he had made the paint was the one that would produce the brilliant color so long desired by glaziers all over Europe when the paint was fired onto the white glass. Just as he stood up and began closing the kiln, a fellow brother appeared in the doorway. Father Abbott directed me to bid you begin your appointed rounds in the village, he said. At once, replied Brother James. Just before leaving, he noticed that a small button had dropped from his clothes onto the one piece of glass. But he closed the kiln. It would have to remain until he had completed the task assigned him. Prompt obedience was more important than any piece of painted glass. Perhaps the feeling of loss he experienced was God's way of telling him that he was too attached to material things. After all, what need did a monk have for a silver button? Even so, he would miss it. Now his work in the village kept him away the remainder of the afternoon, and he could not return to the workshop until after the evening office of Vespers. And as he brought a candle near the kiln opening, he was disappointed. His new mixture had not produced the color he sought. However, as he removed the pieces of glass, he was startled to find on one of them a perfect golden circle. It was the remainder of his silver button. He studied it carefully, and even in the weak candlelight, he was certain it was the exact color he wanted. And in his mind, God had rewarded his obedience 
with his deepest earthly longing. This is the story of how an Italian monk in a German monastery in the 15th century made one of the most important discoveries in the history of stained glass. In our modern context, we're most likely to see stained glass in places of worship as decoration, as part of the architectural beauty of a space. However, stained glass used to and still can tell the story of our faith. For many years, for many decades even, even centuries, the stories of faith were passed down orally from one generation to the next. Stories of what God has done in our world were passed from parent to child and community to community, year after year, story after story, memory unto memory, preserved in the hearts and minds of the people of God. After a while, these stories began to be written down, but this work was laborious and highly skilled. Can you imagine? trying to sit down and hand copy the entirety of the scriptures. No ballpoint gel pen, no printing press, no keyboard and word processor. And to compound the challenge, many of the people were illiterate. And so with printed scriptures at a minimum and illiteracy at a maximum, another way to tell the stories of faith were needed. Enter stained glass windows. They were perhaps our first picture Bibles. From the medieval period on, one major purpose of stained glass windows was to instruct Christians in their faith. In a time when few Europeans could read, the windows carried important lessons to the vast majority of churchgoers. One of the abbots of the time wrote, The pictures in the windows are there for the sole purpose of showing simple people who cannot read the Holy Scriptures what they must believe. A 12th century catechism, a book of Catholic religious instruction asked, What should one do on entering a church? One should take holy water, adore the Blessed Sacrament, and then walk around the church and contemplate the windows. Can you think of some stained glass you've seen? They frequently portray the scripture's most memorable stories. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, or Jesus around the Last Supper in the upper room with his disciples, Moses in the presence of the burning bush, these stories can be recognized immediately at first glance, and others require a bit of teaching and interpreting. Lilies in the scene symbolize purity. Palm leaves symbolize martyrdom. Joseph, Jesus' father, is recognized by his carpenter's tools. Mark, the evangelist, by the winged lion. Some imagery is meant to draw parallels. For instance, a church might display the story of Jonah emerging from the whale after three days, a cross from a window depicting the story of Jesus' resurrection emerging from the tomb on the third day. Every story requires a bit of interpretation from the hearer. Just like any piece of art requires a little interpretation from the one who experiences it. You might even ask yourself, which stories of faith do you tell most often? Do you lean more heavily into the prophets, seeking justice for the oppressed and liberation for the enslaved? Or do you find yourself more frequently in the poetic language of the Psalms? offering them in prayer and resonating with their wisdom? Do you find yourself drawn to the life and ministry of Jesus? 
Or do you lean into the teaching and instruction of the New Testament letters? If you were to tell the story of faith in just an image or two, which would you portray? The stories we tell tell a lot about us. And the images we display tell a lot about what we believe and what we value. When I was in seminary, our Christian education professor assigned us a project called Slices. We were to take 150 slices or snapshots of an aspect of our church and explore its meaning in depth. For instance, where was the pulpit and how was it displayed? Did a tower above the congregation with ornate carving? Or was it simple, down low with the congregation? That was one slice. Were there banners in worship? Where were they hung? What did they say? That was one slice. Where is the communion table? Is it absent or is it present? Is it tucked away off to the side or is it front and center? That was one slice. We might even ask, where are our own stained glass windows? and What do they depict? What story do they tell? I've always admired the stained glass in our parlor designed by Lee Hankins and dedicated in 2002. You might have noticed the glass when you enter our front doors or if you've spent time in this space. I know you remember seeing Matthew preach in front of these window panes last week because you would never skip a Sunday in worship, right? While I find this glass beautiful, I never knew it was so full of hidden meaning. For instance, the rising sun in the middle is to remind us of the continually rising hope of our loving God. The sun's rays reach out to the furthest most points of our universe. The four stars in the window remind us of the four gospels, reflecting the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. The triangles found throughout the window represent the triune God who holds us in compassionate embrace. You'll see several panels containing St. Andrew's cross, the red-shaped X cross that is part of our denominational logo. St. Andrew is said to have been martyred by crucifixion on an X-shaped cross, believing himself unworthy to be crucified on a vertical cross like Jesus. If we look carefully, we'll see the symbol of the fish. The Greek word for fish is ichthus, which is an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God. I never knew these pieces were present or what they meant. And I also appreciate the artist's note at the end of his explanation. He writes about the piece. It is hoped that each of you will find your own symbols or special meanings as you view the windows in your meditation. We each experience God differently. We each tell the story differently. Some of us tell it with words. Others tell it with their actions. Most of us do both. And only part of the work can be done by the artist. The rest we must do ourselves. The American poet Nikki Giovanni wrote that a poem exists between the mind of the poet and the ear of the one who hears. We might just as accurately say that stained glass exists between the hand of the artist and the eye of the beholder. The most important act in appreciating any kind of visual art whether it be a painting, or a statue, or a stained glass window, is actually seeing it. We must learn to look carefully. We should say the same thing about the Bible. We must learn to read it carefully. 
we must learn to tell the story carefully. I'm sometimes hesitant to tell it at all myself for fear that I'll misinterpret it or do more harm than good. The psalm writers are some of the most artistic storytellers in all of Scripture. They're poets. They're songwriters. They are liturgists. They give us a glimpse of the character and nature of God while giving us a front row seat for the unfolding relationship between God and humanity. What picture, what image of God do you hold? What story have you been told? Many people have received a story of God in the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures of one who is angry and vengeful, of a God who is spiteful and holds grudges, of a God who is detached and inaccessible. We're left to wonder, is this characterization fair? Is it accurate? The psalmist sure doesn't seem to think so. What is the story the psalmist tells about God? Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. And perhaps one of those most familiar verses, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This is the story we tell, one of greatness and praise, and it's the story we inherit, one of the goodness and righteousness of God. This is the story that we have lived into and made our own, God's mercy and patience and steadfast love. God's chesed. And who is this mercy and love offered to? A select few? To the ones who believe correctly? No, no. Verse 9 reads, The Lord is good to all, and His compassion is over all that He has made. This is the story people of faith should be telling. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds, the psalmist writes. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. All people, you and me, now and forevermore. This is the story of God we inherit and the story of God that we pass along. Thanks be to God this day.
heart is a powerful thing. It has a way of connecting with us, making us feel something. Sometimes that's joy and hope and and, and love. Sometimes it's fear or uh, discomfort or even disgust. Art has a way of connecting right through to this emotional or even spiritual aspect of who we are. Whenever I see an image of the Last Supper, I feel something. I look at the the faces of those gathered around Jesus there at that table in the upper room, and I see the turmoil, I see the the anxiety, the fear, the, the frustration, the uncertainty on the faces of the disciples, and and I feel something. I feel connected to them. I can I can resonate. I I felt those feelings before as well. You know, I'll often ask people. What's your favorite part of worship? And secretly, I'm hoping it's the sermon. But most often, the response is communion. Why? Because in that moment, when we break bread and we share the cup together, we feel something. We know these are everyday things, whether it's bread and juice, cookies and milk, whatever it is that you're using this morning for communion. We know that you can get them at any grocery store or make them yourself. They're simple everyday things, yet they connect with us, our spirit, our emotions, and we feel something. We feel the presence of God. We feel the connection that we have to one another. Friends, I feel grateful to be sharing in this meal with you. This morning, I'm using Thin Mints and Milk because it's a favorite around our house. But I have a feeling that even as I break these elements with you, we'll feel something connecting us, surrounding us. We remember how long ago Jesus took bread, broke it, and offered it with those to those disciples gathered there to share together, saying, take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. And after they shared a meal together, they shared also the cup. And he said to them, take and drink. This is the cup of a new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. May we eat, drink, and remember together. My name is Brayden. My parents give me money each Saturday to do different things with. $3.50 is for whatever I want. $1 is for something $50 or higher. And $0.50 is for giving. One way I chose to give with that money was to donate money to the zoo. I did it because I decided to help wildlife, I like animals, and part of my mission statement from school is to save wildlife. Another way I used that money was to donate to the Mahomes Foundation for BBS last year. I also donated to a church some weekends when I had saved enough money for it. A few years after Beth and I were married, we went with the team to Haiti for 10 days to work in a rural village. One afternoon, we went to a church up in the hills that required us to hike to it as there were no roads that led up there. A group of local Haitians who participated in the church went with us. So before we left, we made sandwiches, put them in the truck and headed out. And then we hiked up to the church and I noticed a problem. There were way more people with us than the sandwiches we had made. So church got done, we hiked back down, and I began to wonder what would happen next as we stood in the circle and they started distributing the sandwiches. It was at that moment that Beth and I witnessed one of the most amazing acts of generosity that we have ever seen. Because you see, these people didn't just brush up and try to make sure they got a sandwich for themselves when they started to realize there wasn't enough to go around. 
Instead, without anyone suggesting it, they started tearing the sandwiches in half to make sure every single person received some food rather than some get none. Since that day, Beth and I have tried our best to try to cultivate that practice in our life because we know that's the type of world we want our children to be a part of and grow up in. And so we make giving and generosity not something we just do as individuals for when we're older and have a job, but we try to create it as a family practice so the boys can participate too and give to those in need. Currently, we have two ways you can donate. You can write a check and send it to the address listed below. Or you can go to our website, www.lschristian.com, and click the donate button, then follow the instructions. Thank you, Lee Summit Christian Church, for your generosity. Let us pray. Loving God, I just give you thanks for the fact that my family is participating in church in a community where we live out this practice of generosity and kindness towards others. And we just pray that this offering would continue to be a blessing to those in need during this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, I want to thank you for having been in worship with us at Lee Summit Christian Church this day. We hope that if you continue to have prayer requests, that you will continue to share them with the office or with the ministry team, that we might continue as a community of faith to be in prayer both with one another and for one another. We hope as well that if you have found your way to us online and if you have been looking for a church home that you are still welcome to join with us. We welcomed a new member, Lisa, in this past week and we look forward to welcoming many others of you as you find your way to us online or in person. And now, as we prepare to change the light, we give thanks that the light of Christ does not go out, but that it only changes, so that the light that was in this place at this time might go forth to be in all places at all times. Go in peace. Our service has ended and our ministry now begins.
Before we depart, I did want to take one moment to offer a special word of gratitude to the authors of this book, Gospels in Glass, Stained Glass Windows in Missouri Churches by Ken Lubering and Robin Burnett. This book was extremely helpful to me in learning about some of the history of stained glass and some of the process in its making throughout the years, even into modern times. The book has many beautiful pictures of stained glass windows in churches and places of worship throughout the state of Missouri. would be grateful for you to borrow my copy or to find a copy of it online that you might order it. It is an excellent read and an excellent resource to have. I offer them my gratitude. Okay. <laughs> that was a good one. That was good. Okay, we did it.